Good morning. Um, if you'd stand with us, please. In our lungs, 
So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. And all the earth will shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord, and all the earth will shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord, it's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. Pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only.
Father God, we just thank you for this day that you've given us, Lord. We thank you for being able to worship um, in your presence, Father, whether it's at home, whether it's gathered in this building, Father, but the, just the freedoms and the rights that we have to do those things, Lord. And we just pray that as we go throughout this service and throughout this week, Lord, that your light would shine um, from us to others um, during this time. Father, we just thank you for all that you, all you do in your name. All right, thank you guys. Thank you for worshiping with us, folks. Um, well, today's a little different day, as you can tell. Um, there's a there's few people quarantining a little bit, kind of changes the way things look just a little. And, um, and that being said, a lot of people at home, good to see you. Glad you're joining us today. And um, that being said, I'm going to do my very, very best uh, JB impression. But I'm going to do it very quickly all right, um, today. And, uh, and as we approach our announcement time, there's something we like to do each and every week, and it has everything to do with uh, the mission statement um, that we believe is scriptural and what the leadership has rallied around here um, at Deering. And we've boiled that down to make it very memorable to three words, and they're this, being, bringing, and building. And what that amounts to first, right off the bat, is this, being a light to others so that they might see what we do and not say, that is a good dude right there. Man, he's just so nice. Just love that guy or that gal. Man, she's just awesome. She's just always helping people out. That's not why you do it. You do it, so as Jesus said, so that they will not glorify you, but glorify your Father in heaven. Okay. Now, the job isn't done with that. That is one of our responsibilities as, as the ambassadors of Jesus Christ in this world. The messengers of his in this world is by our deeds and by our actions um, to back up what we say. But that means you say something. And what you say is this, the good news of the message of his kingdom. All right? Uh, and, and making sure that people understand that without Jesus, there is no future in this life or beyond. And, and that is the responsibility of not a select few. That is a responsibility of everyone who wears the name of Jesus Christ. Right, so that's what we're looking back and say, well, has that been a part of what I've done in the week behind? Um, and following that with, with the building of disciples. And that really isn't that complicated. It's just growing in Christ. That's what it amounts to. Matter of fact, we're going to talk about that some a little bit later today. And, and growing in the Lord, meaning this, looking more like Jesus in this, in this world and helping one another's brothers and sisters to do that because this world needs more Jesus folks, um, and um, for us to grow up in the Lord, that's discipleship. Um, so being, bringing, and building, we keep those things in your mind. And JB you typically goes from there beyond that to, to other parts of that mission statement. I'll leave that for him next week. Um, and at this time, I'm going to let the first through third grade know that you can go ahead and go back to children's church, first through third grade. You have that option available if you want to take advantage of it. Okay. Um, that being said, a couple of housekeeping announcements. First of all, our service from this point on will build towards communion. Now, when you came in the doors, if you did not, there's, there's a table back there with some communion stuff on it. If you did not grab that, that's just fine. Um, I will pray to end the message as we lead towards communion. And then after that, if you just want to raise your hand, there will be somebody there in the back to bring that to you if you'd like. Once you're done with those, at the end of our service, you just drop them in that trash can there or one in the foyer. Um, and then after our time of communion, after I pray, we'll give a little bit of time for you to, to take part in that by yourself or with your family, however you want to do that. Um, and then I will close us in prayer. So um, that housekeeping said and done, just two more things. Um, communication is very, very important. It's becoming more and more important um, just with kind of the world that we find ourselves in right now. Um, just strange. Um, we would not have anticipated this a year ago. And um, so that communication, the way I want to talk to you about it is in two ways. We haven't made this announcement in a while, and we need to do it more often. But on the back of that chair in front of you, you're going to find what we call a connection card. On that card, if you are not a part of the prayer text line and you would like to be, what that looks like is this. Uh, it happens several times a week, typically, that a text comes out, somebody from within the church or somebody who knows someone. There's a pretty big footprint right here, okay, folks? So sometimes there's a lot of prayer texts that come through. And that gets sent out by one of our elders, David Hershey. It goes to a 
large group of people, and then we ask you to pray. Very quickly, just as quickly as you can. Okay. That being said, if you're driving down the road, first of all, you should not have read that text message. Okay? But if somebody in the car read the text message to you, don't close your eyes to pray unless you pull over. Please. There's nothing in the Bible that says anything that you have to close your eyes to pray. Keep your eyes open and pray. But the reason for that is this. It's, there's power in the people of God praying together. There really, really is. And it's encouraging. I've put prayer texts on there myself. And it's encouraging to know that my brothers and sisters are praying for someone I know or for someone in my family. So, so do that. Now, if you aren't a part of that and you would like to be on one of those connection cards, write your name, write your phone number, and then at the top of that card, write prayer text line. And then on your way out today, there's a couple offering boxes in the foyer on either exit on either side. There are black boxes right there. You can drop those cards in there, and we'll see to it. We just added two this past week. We'll see to it that you get added to that prayer text line. Okay? want you to be sure um, that you know that. By the way, um, offering, if we're not going to pass any place, just like we're not going to pass place for communion, if that's something you'd like to take part in, you can do that in those boxes as well. The other line of communication, I'll make this really quick because JB talks about it pretty often, um, but it's very important right now just because we need some communication out there occasionally, especially Christmas coming and that sort of thing. Um, we call it Band. You can get it off of the App Store if you're an iPhone person, if you're the Google Play Store, if you're an Android person. And um, if you find that, download it and then search for Daring, Daring, Daring Christian Church or Daring Connect and DC Connect, and that will send you uh, right to where you need to go. Um, and, and that will be very good about helping keep you updated about, about things going on. All right? And that also helps us because that's growing each and every week. If you can put your picture on there, not a picture of the deer you shot, okay, picture of you so we can put a, a face with the name, um, that would be good. Now, if you want to hold the deer and put your face in it, hey, we got nothing wrong with that, okay, but just just put your whole family in there with the deer, that's what we do, all right, so anyway, I'm sorry, I chased a squirrel, I apologize, I told you I wasn't going to do that, I was going to make this quick, you can call me JB now, um, anyway, so um, that being said, you do get that, that will give you information that you very much will appreciate um, things coming in the future. All right. All that being said, um, I'm going to grab some stuff, and we're going to get started in Matthew if you want to grab your Bibles. All right, guys, for several weeks now, we have been looking, actually a couple of months, we've been looking at the hard sayings of Jesus. We're wrapping that up today. This is our last sermon um, in that sermon series. We'll move on into something else in preparation for Christmas next week. Um, turn to Matthew 22 if you have your Bibles with you. A little bit of a note about that. Um, the Bible that I'll be reading from as well as what will be on the screen behind me is the New American Standard Version. That looks a little different than what you have in your hands. That's just fine. Just want you to make sure you're aware of that. Um, one more thing about opening these up. Let's, let's each one of us commit right now that this will not be um, the last time we open these this week. Okay, um, That growing in Christ thing, a big part of that is learning this and putting it to practice in our lives. Right, So let's make that commitment now to be doing this perhaps on our own, perhaps with our families, whatever that looks like. Um, this is one of God's greatest gifts to his people. And there's a lot of people who have lived and died in this world and people who are alive still today who would love to have this in their language or love to be able to afford to get one if it's in their language, and they don't. And we take it for granted. So please, let, please, let's not do that. So open this up this week. All right, Matthew 22 is, is what we're taking a look at here. We're going to look at about the first half, specifically the first 13, 14 verses um, in this. It amounts to a parable. If, you're, if you like stories, you're going to like this. We looked at a parable last week. If you like stories, you would have loved Jesus because when he walked in this world, he told a lot of stories and he told some good ones. So um, that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to ask God to be right in the middle of that with us um, and we'll dive in. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we come before you this day and we thank you so much for who you are and your incredible call on in our lives. Lord, we pray that as we look to the words of your son, that you would open our hearts 
to the gift of your word. We pray that your spirit will work amongst us, Lord. And if change needs to happen in our lives, that you will bring it about by these two amazing gifts, the gift of your word and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray that um, we would be open-minded as we look to your word today. And we pray, Father, as we see it, that if change needs to take place in our lives, you would make that clear to us. It's Thanksgiving, Lord, that's been on our minds a lot here recently. We have so much to be thankful from you. Help that to be in our minds and hearts as we study today together. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Might have been a little bit different Thanksgiving for some of you this year. I mean, it, it really, it really, really might have been. Um, quarantines have, have had their effect in, in some families' lives. Perhaps, perhaps the, the, the vulnerability of a loved one kind of changed your plans just a little bit. There might have been some of you in this room who Thanksgiving for you just looked kind of like just with your immediate family. In your, in your home. And, and, and that, was, that was really it. And, and it, it, looked, it looked a little different. And, and, you know, looking back on it, probably thinking, I don't know if I want to do that again. All right? I kind of like, like getting together at Grandma and Grandpa's and all the cousins running around, you know. Maybe some of you do some of those family reunions where you don't even know the people's names. Like, I've been to some of those family reunions before, and it's like, I'm related to that person? I had no, absolutely no idea. So, maybe this year was a little bit different for you, and maybe it was kind of tough. But you know what can be worse than that? And for many of us, we have to look back a ways to remember this. Maybe we can't even truly remember it. It's that long ago. But you remember the elementary school years? Those parties that Zed, you never got invited to. And that hurt. I know that that hurt. And then there are those parties in high school that your parents saw to it that you didn't get invited to, you know. And, and it's just like, the, just not getting invited to the party. I mean, it's just dunk. And maybe you remember that. Maybe that still happens. Like, I don't even get invited to my own family Thanksgivings. Goodness gracious. A number of Jesus' parables had a party theme. And when I mean a party theme, I mean specific party. I'm talking about a wedding banquet. After all, Jesus is, is the bridegroom of the church, his people. So as he was pointing towards that future, there was more than one occasion where he talked about a wedding feast, a wedding banquet. And for us to understand this, before we even dive into this parable, we've got to really wrap our minds around the significance of that looked a lot different than, than the weddings that most of us attend. You've heard me talk about, many of you have heard me talk about this before. You know, I think back to Donna and I's wedding 15 years ago in this room. And I don't remember a whole lot about it, to be honest with you. It just kind of just happened. And, um, and afterwards, uh, because, I'm sorry, we loved everybody who was there, but we weren't going to feed you. All right, I mean, just, we weren't, that's expensive. So, I mean, I got a few little snacks and got some cake, you know, and stuff like that. And we sent you on your way, and we, well, you sent us on our way, kind of, and then I'm assuming you went on your way. Uh, and and the, whole, the whole thing, the whole affair was probably about, you know, maybe two, and a, two hours, two and a half hours, somewhere in there. Now, some of you have been to weddings much different than that. There's a big old meal, there's all kinds, of, and man, it's like, man, my, like six, seven hours, like, wow, that's impressive. The Jewish, average Jewish wedding was days, sometimes up to seven days. Seven days. How many of you who don't like that much going to weddings would like going to a seven-day wedding of a second cousin that you've seen four times in your life, all right? Well, that's the type of thing we were talking about. Now, don't get me wrong. This was usually something greatly looked forward to. This was a shindig. I mean, there was a lot going on. And when you're dealing with the upper crust of society, it wasn't just a party. It was extravagant. All right? So keep that in mind as we dive into this parable. Now, a little bit about what's going on when Jesus gives us this parable. It is the Passion Week. And what that means is this. It's Jesus' last week of life before the cross. 
His entire life, he came here to go to a cross. That's what he came for. That was his passion. That was his devotion. And that's why it's called the Passion Week. It took place in Jerusalem. And Jesus, by the time he tells this parable, he has been there in Jerusalem for three days. This is day three. And the first two days had hyped the crowds. I mean, his popularity was up here. There are, there are several reasons for that. One of the reasons is he cleansed the temple for the second time. He did it near the beginning of his ministry, and now he did it towards the end. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about that. I'll just tell you, during the Passover, people came from all around the known parts of the world to Jerusalem to celebrate, and it was a fiasco in some ways. And they turned the temple into a circus just to fleece people from their money, okay? And it infuriated Jesus. I mean infuriated him. So he, man, he got with it. We're talking driving out animals, driving out people. I mean, he was upset. And, and the, the crowds are watching this, and they're like cheering him on, like say, this is amazing. Now, as you can imagine, those who lined their pockets from what took place in the temple were the Pharisees, the religious elite. They didn't like this because they didn't. They cared about two things more than anything else, power and money, all right? And Jesus was affecting both of those, making them look bad and taking the money away from them as well. So the Pharisees were enraged. Now, John, we're looking at Matthew, but the gospel writer John lets us know something we talked about last week we need to keep in mind, that not all of the Pharisees, all of the priests, were against Jesus, Okay? There were believers amongst them, but if they spoke that belief, they would be kicked out of the Sanhedrin, the temple, or the synagogue, so they kept their mouths shut. And to be honest, John lets us know that, but he doesn't speak too glowingly of them who kept their mouths shut. Okay, as I said, we're on day three. The day will end with Jesus completely dismantling the Pharisees verbally. All right? They tried to trap him with religious, social, and political questions. Okay, and, and all of this started with the, with the religious leaders saying to Jesus, he cleansed the temple uh, uh, the day before, there's a lot going on, um, and they say, who gives you the authority to do what you're doing? The things that you do, the things that you say, who gives you the authority, because obviously Jesus was a powerful man. Okay, and, and they didn't like him that much, and they wanted to know how he thought he had the authority to do what he's doing. And Jesus says, I'm not going to tell you where I got that authority from. I've told you many times, and you won't listen. He asked his own question. Oh, I'm going to chase a rabbit here. I can't chase a squirrel. i got to stop. i got to stop. It's going to take us forever to get to the passage. So Jesus basically does answer their question of who gives him the authority by telling them three stories. Three stories. The first couple of stories definitely get um, the Pharisees riled up even more. And they were vineyard type of stories. Um, not the names of vineyards, our old neighbors. No, this is like a vineyard where they grow grapes. Okay. And um, uh, we, looked at, we looked at one like that a little bit last week. All right. So the Pharisees, by the end of these first two parables, they know that Jesus got the crosshairs right on them. And they are not happy at all. So Jesus tells one last parable, and this parable is, as I've said already, about a party. So let's jump into it. We're just going to read through it and kind of talk about it as we work our way through the first part of this story. Again, we're in Matthew chapter 22. It says, Jesus spoke to them again in parables. Your Bible might look just a little bit, your version might look a little bit different. Some of the versions might say Jesus answered them. It's, it's a way you could translate it. Does it mean that Jesus saw the reaction of the Pharisees and as a result to seeing that reaction of them, he's answering them? I don't know. I don't know. Something to think about, though. It says, Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. Now, something to understand about this, maybe some of you have received these before. Actually, I received one, my family did, just earlier this year. Um, and these are kind of, you can usually know this is going to be a pretty fancy wedding. You know, going to be a shindig, all right? I don't know why I'm saying that. That's just in my brain. Okay, um, lots of times you will get one of those save the date cards. Be a cute little picture of the couple, you know, bride and groom to be. And it'll have something on it that says, save, save the date. And it's usually several months ahead of time. Maybe you've got one of those before. Long before this invitation we're going to read about goes out, that's already been done. The people know about the date. They know what's coming. And now it's the day of the event. It says this, verse 3. 
The king, he sent out slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to come. Now, something that the New American Standard doesn't put in here, maybe your version does, there's a little bit more to that unwillingness to come than meets the eye. That, in the Greek, is the present perfect tense. And what that means is this, they continually refuse to come. It's like, not coming, not going to do it, shut up, leave. (laughs) I'm not coming to your party. Go, leave me alone. So they they say this with rapidity. Is that a word, rapidity? Repeatability, repeatedly? Repeatedly, that's what I'm looking for. All right, my blood sugar isn't low, don't worry. Okay, Um, so they repeatedly say, we're not coming to your party. So look what happens. Look what happens next. He's, he adds a little bit to the pot here, the king. He doesn't give up easily. He says, again, he sent out other slaves saying, tell those who have been invited, behold, I have prepared my dinner. It's interesting that they put dinner there. It's actually more of, in the, in the Greek, a breakfast, okay? So this is early in the morning, okay? He's saying, it's done. The bacon, man, the bacon's fried. Well, it wouldn't be bacon. Sorry, it's a Jewish wedding. Sorry. Okay. All right. So he says this. He says, tell those who've been invited, behold, I've prepared my dinner. My ox and my fattened livestock, they're all butchered. Everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. Guys, he didn't go out there and pick a cow out of the pasture and slit her throat and cut her up and put her over the fire. No, this is no pasture-fed beef. This is corn-fed beef, all right? This is the good stuff. This is a king we're talking about. This is going to be a party of parties. And he's telling people, come to the party. It is going to be fun. Okay? So he flavors it up here just a little bit. Look what happens next. It would be ridiculous if it wasn't so true. What really happened through history. But they paid no attention and went on their way, one to his own farm, another to his business. The rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. The reaction is very much what you would expect from a king. The king was enraged. He sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. Now, that is Old Testament judgment type of language there, okay? There is some fury, some wrath taking place here, okay? So that's what happens to the first people invited to the party. But here's the deal. His son's still getting married. The calf, the cow, the oxen, the wine, everything is ready There is going to be a party. Verse 8, then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Remember that word worthy. We're going to touch on that a little bit more here in a little bit. Go therefore to the main highways and find as many as you, and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. Okay, let me tell you a little something about the main highways. They weren't four lanes. All right. We're just talking about the travel routes between towns, between cities. Some of them were more traveled than others. And it's a pretty interesting collection of people that you're going to find on the highways. One of the first things you're going to find is sojourners, people who are working. Maybe their, their, their occupation takes them away from home. They're strangers. This isn't home. Okay, They live on the street. They live on the roads. Um, some other that are outside the cities on the roads are those who aren't really allowed in the cities. Uh, maybe because of some sort of social stigma of one kind or another or um, an eth- ethnicity. Um, th- 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 they're on the roads for a reason. Now, the other side of that, another one of Jesus' parables, um, we call it the parable of the Good Samaritan. You remember who else is out on the road, especially road Jericho, all right? Um, thieves, bandits, all right? And the king sends out his slaves to gather people on the roads. Why does he do that? The city's burned. <laughs> the city folk are dead. But there's going to be a party. So he sends them out and collects all of this collection of people. And look in verse 10. It says this. The slaves went out. They did exactly what the, what the king said. They went out to the streets and gathered together all they found. 
both evil and good. And the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. Were these people worthy to be at this party? (laughs) No. They weren't even originally invited to this party. What made them worthy is what? They came. (laughs) They answered the invitation and they showed up. So, here's what you got now. Um, You got the odd duck who shows up next. If you use that terminology before the odd duck, you do know where that comes from, right? It comes from the fable, the ugly duckling. I, I, I hope. I mean, surely you've heard the ugly duckling, all right? Maybe even watched a little little cartoon about the ugly duckling, you know? And you got this thing that was just so ugly when it was little, but when it grows up, what's it turn into? A swan, and a beautiful swan, right? That's a grandma speaking right there, all right? A beautiful swan, and it's no longer the ugly duckling, and it's so wonderful. Well, there's no swans in this story, all right? What we have here is an odd duck. And let me tell you something. The end of this story doesn't quite have the fairy tale ending of the fable, okay? You got the king. And he's just like, now it took some work here, all right? I mean, this has been a party that was a little hard to get started, okay? But the party is rolling now, and he's just kind of watching. Maybe, maybe some of you dads have been there, some of you dads who've married off your daughters before, and somehow your daughter talked you into having a big party afterwards. I'm glad my daughters aren't here today. They're with Grandma and Grandpa, because they're getting cake, and that's it. And I'm they're not getting married for 30 years, so I'm not worried about it. So anyway, but, but you got the king, you know, this is a big party. So what's he going to do? He's going to be up in the balcony or something, and he is just watching. And he's like, man, this is good. This is good. Went through some work here. It's a little tough, but this is good. And he's surveying the crowd, and what is going on right out there? He sees a little something Catches his attention. Look at verse 11. You'd think that this would jump to verse 14, all right? That's where we're going to end today. But they don't slap, for many are called, but few are chosen, on the end yet. There's something else that's got to happen first. It says in verse 11, the king came in to look over the dinner guests. And he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. Does that sound a little familiar to any of you? Being in a group of people and not having the proper thing on your body. Does that sound vaguely familiar to anything more recent to anyone at all? Anybody? One of these. Anybody been on a plane lately? Anybody here? Tell you what, you try to go get on a plane without one of these, you ain't getting on a plane. <laughs> Tell you, and if you get on the plane with one of these on, and and then you take it off, just hope you're not 30,000 feet yet, because you're getting off the plane, all right? You're not going to stay. It's interesting to me, just looking at that and thinking, thinking there's this guy out there that the king is watching and he zeroes in, zeroes in on somebody and this guy doesn't have the right clothes on and because of that, something's going to happen. You might be thinking, the guy came off the streets, he came off the road. How can the king be given this poor fellow? He didn't even know that morning he was going to a party. How can you be hard on this guy? You might not even have any. Well, a couple of things about that. First of all, this was a king. So we're talking about an extravagant party. And it was a custom that not always happened, but many times when you're dealing with a situation and a party that big, the king with the invitation would send out festive clothing to be worn by those who would attend the feast, attend the banquet. 
Maybe perhaps this guy did have something better. I mean, the text just makes the assumption. Jesus' story makes the assumption that this guy could have done something about what he was wearing. But he chose not to. This man had the option of being prepared, but he was not prepared. Well, the king leaves his perch and he walks straight to the man. This is what happens, verse 12. The king said to him, friend. Remember we talked about that last week in another one of Jesus' parables. Friend, is, was, it was a distancing title. It's what you called someone when you're saying, you stay there, I will stay here. It's not saying, you're my friend. <laughs> okay? So immediately when this man sees the king has singled him out and is speaking to him and starts the speech with this, friend, he's already like, Ugh, this is not going to end well. Friend, how did you come in here without... Wedding clothes. You know, I've heard a lot of things about, about wearing these, and I've seen videos. I mean, have you been to any ball games? That's another place for many times. I've seen poor school administrators at ball games, and you know, you see this look on their face, and they feel awful about doing this, but they're walking around the crowd. Please put your mask on. Please put your mask on. Please put your mask on. And I've even seen videos of people getting tossed out of ball games because they refuse to put a mask on. And usually when they're leaving, they're saying something along the lines of, it's dumb, I don't want to wear it. This is my freedom not to be able to wear it, all right? And whether or not we agree with that or anything, that's not the case of what's taking place here. Look what happens in the rest of this verse. The king asks him a question. How is it that you are here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. He's got nothing to say. He knows that he is in the wrong place. He didn't plead his case. It isn't the fact that the man is unworthy who in that crowd was worthy? No one. No one there was worthy of being there. Okay? The problem was this. He came to the party that he was invited to unworthily. And he had a lack of respect for the king the one who had the authority not only to invite him, but to throw him out. And look what happens. Verse 13. The king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know, it's not that this guy was just thrown out of the light of the party. And then he's, he's grinding his teeth and he's kicking himself for his own foolishness and stubbornness of like, why didn't I put the clothes on? I'm an idiot. Now, this seems to paint a picture a little bit stronger than that. Bind him hand and foot. Throw him into the outer darkness. And in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then we get the end of this parable. Verse 14. You see, actually, this parable could have what some people would call two hard sayings of Jesus. Here's the second. We already went through the first. For many are called, but few are chosen. You see, this parable ends with a powerful picture of God's sovereignty. I mean a powerful picture, folks. You see, uh, this is one parable. They call them stock metaphors, okay, when it comes to parables. Now, not all the parables fit into these categories, but many of the parables fit into categories where they use, quote, stock metaphors. In other this, when you see a king mentioned, who's it referring to? God. So it's talking about. When you see a kingdom, who's it referring to? God's people. 
When it's talking about a party, it's talking about the end, the celebration for God's people at the end of all things, which is really the beginning of all things. And this is one parable that the stock metaphors fit in, and there's more of them than that. I won't go through the whole list, but this is one parable that fits within it very, very well. So the king is who? The king is God. And what you're referring to here in this passage, in verse 14, for many are called, but few are chosen. So let's, let's break this down just a little bit in light of the parable and the context of the parable. I'm going to put, put my mask up real quick. All right. Getting crowded up here. Got too many things on my platform. Okay. Now listen very, very carefully. Many are called. What exactly is that getting at? For one thing, that word many, it was very, very common in the Semitic languages, meaning Greek, Aramaic, and Hebrew, all three that were used of the day by different people, that many very much could, not always, but could be signify all. All were called. All were called. Or the vast majority were called. It's the way the words were used in Jesus' day. How are they called? Look at the parable. They are called by slaves going out and inviting them. Okay, so those slaves represent prophets. You got to remember, Jesus is not only pointing towards the future with this parable. He's very much pointing towards the past as well. And not just those slaves, that first bunch that went out that they didn't want to listen to. What happened to the second bunch? Oh, my goodness, they killed them. They killed those slaves. And that's what I told you. If it, it, would be, it would be almost ridiculous if it wasn't so true. It is true. For centuries, God's people of Israel had killed those sent to them by God with his message, God's messengers. You know the most recent one was when Jesus was telling this? The last of the prophets, the Old Testament prophets, his name was John the Baptist. John Baptist, who Jesus said, the greatest of all born of woman. There, there is no one greater than John Baptist. Why is that? Was he just that awesome of a person? It wasn't only that he was a credibly powerful prophet. It's the fact that he was an instrument of God to prepare the way for Jesus. What a privilege. What a message. What did they do to him? They killed him. Cut his head off. Killed him. It has happened since that time. God has sent people into this world to present his message. And time and time again throughout the centuries, many of those people have died for their message. So what was this message? What was the message of the slaves? Look to the parable. It wasn't complicated. The message was this. Come. It was an invitation. Come to the party. This is a party of all parties. This king knows how to throw a party. You need to come. Okay. So we got the many. We got the called. What about the few who are chosen? How are they chosen? Look at the parable. They are chosen by their willingness to respond to the invitation. That's how. They are chosen. According to Jesus' parable here, God's election includes our response as well as his choice. That's the way it works. I've been debating this idea of God's sovereignty versus man's responsibility and what Scripture has to say about that. I've been debating this ever since college. I don't want to tell you how long this is. 25 years now. With, with theologically minded believers and friends. I believe the Bible paints a very clear picture of how two things work together when it comes to salvation of man. God's sovereign will and man's responsibility. The choosing of following the call. Obviously, God's action is primary. He's the mover and driver of it all. These debates are fine. They take place, maybe you've been in the middle of some of those debates yourself. And one day, we'll find out who's right, because we all like to be right, don't we? Here's the thing, I think by the time we find out who's right, we won't really care. 
you got a list of things that you want to talk to God about? It's like, I got my list right here, and, and I'm going to say, what did you mean by that? Or, or Paul, Paul, what did you mean by that? Or, or Peter, what did you mean by that? Or, as I said, Jesus himself, what did you mean by that log in the eye thing? And don't ju- what, what did you mean by that? I got a feeling, though, but when we are in God's presence, we're going to forget our lists. I don't know that for certain, and we'll have all eternity to figure it out. But I think that's kind of what will end up happening. But when it comes to this question, there's something much more important than who's right. One time, really bad believers of Jesus Christ, and we'll understand what I mean by bad. I mean this. They look back upon their past before Jesus, and they see nothing but darkness, wickedness, selfishness, ugliness of a level that they don't think anybody else can understand. Now, as I'm saying this, understand something, folks. Every one of us in this room, followers of Jesus and not, are all bad, okay? But there are some who look back upon their past and they see ugly. And they have an incredible level of shame. And they would throw themselves right up there with Paul. You know what Paul said about himself? He said, Jesus Christ came to save sinners, of which I am foremost of all, because I persecuted the church. You see, sometimes really bad believers sometimes struggle with how God could really love them. And then they come to passages like this in Scripture and they ask themselves the question, am I one of the chosen ones? What if I'm not? How do I know? If you've been there before and you've asked yourself questions like that before, then I want you to listen very closely to the end of this parable. For many are called but few are chosen. Here's the question. If that's your history and that's what you look back upon, the question is this. When you heard the call, did you respond? Did you respond? I mean, honestly, ask yourself the question, did I respond? And not only that, look at the whole parable. Did I respond to God on His terms? Folks, the way to heaven is Jesus. There is no other way. And a good old boy relationship with Jesus is not the relationship I'm talking about here. Yeah, I I know. I know about him. I know of him. He's a good guy. When I ask the question, did you come to God on his terms? Understand something, brothers and sisters. This gift to us from God paints a picture of how we respond to the call of God in our lives. And it's there for a reason. It has nothing to do with earning our salvation. It's unearnable. There's nobody in this room who can earn and make yourself worthy enough to waltz in the pearly gates. Not happening. But this tells us how to respond to our Savior and our Lord. And that's one of the biggest parts about his terms. He says, follow me. Take up your cross, follow me. I'm in charge now. Does that mean we never mess up again? No, that's not what it means. But the question is this, am I following my Lord? Let me tell you, if your answer is yes, then rest well as you grow in Christ. You are chosen. But if your answer is no, then you 
you need to do some talking to somebody soon. At the close of this service or sometime soon, if you look back and you're not sure about what you see. Brothers and sisters, we have so much to be thankful for. We're going to share in communion here in just a little bit. Something I want us to think about as we do that, since it is a time of thanksgiving, is this, come face to face with the fact we've danced all over it today, and it's truth. There's not a one of us worthy to come into the presence of God. An all-knowing, all-powerful, God, holy, if he were to show up in this room, there wouldn't be one of us that wouldn't be on our face, eating the carpet, we're all unworthy, and the only thing that makes us worthy is the blood of Jesus Christ. What happened to that? What happened to that guy in that wedding feast who kind of sauntered in there? I don't even know what he was thinking. Jesus, maybe that's a question for Jesus. What in the world was that guy thinking in your story? What was he thinking? Walking into that wedding feast, not wearing the clothes he's supposed to wear. What was he thinking? You know a pretty incredible parallel passage to that scripture? Because we know what happened to that guy. He didn't have the right clothes on. He paid the ultimate price. Paul wrote a letter to the Galatian church. Interesting letter. He started off with a bang. He wasn't too happy with these people. You see, what they were doing is they were taking the gospel, which the gospel is we are saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. And they added to it. They say, okay, so here's what you got to do. You got to you respond to Jesus, and then you got to be circumcised. All right? Telling that to... 30-year-old men. Uh, okay. So, so Paul's like, no, you're trying to add to the gospel, and you're making it not even a gospel at all. I mean, he was frustrated at these people, and it was kind of a Jewish thing. It was, it was Jewish people trying to put some of the traditions on top and into the message, their message to the Gentiles, and they were upsetting them. It was, it was not a good deal going on. And, and what Paul is trying to make them understand is this. Don't you know that in Christ, you're not a Jew? They're not a Gentile. In Christ, you're not a man. You're not a woman. Now, don't, don't misunderstand me. He wasn't getting rid of, rid of gender and, and what that means. What he was talking about is this. What matters is this, how you are identified. And you're identified through Jesus. You're a follower of Jesus. And you know what he says? Galatians 3.27. For all who have been baptized into Jesus Christ have been clothed. What are the wedding clothes, people? Wedding clothes of Jesus. We have to wear Jesus. You're like, uh, what does that mean? <laughs> it means what Paul said it was. If you have come and committed to Jesus, you've been clothed with Jesus. You know how God sees you from now on? If, you, if you're seeing yourself bad, you're like, how could God love me? You know how God can love you? Because when he looks at you, who does he see? Jesus, that's who he sees. And are you telling me we don't have something to be thankful for this Thanksgiving? That when God looks at me, he sees Jesus Christ. Wow. And that's how we're going to enjoy the banquet for eternity. Because of Jesus. So today, let's thank him for that. And in the back of our mind, as we thank him, let's remember that the world needs to see a little bit of Jesus in the way that we're living too. 
God sees Jesus when he looks at us, but we are to be looking more like Jesus to everyone else. That's called growing in the Lord. And every one of us in this room can grow some more. Let's focus on that as we share in communion today. If you did not get a cup, as I said, raise your hand after I pray and we'll see to it that you get one if you want to share in communion today. And then I'll close us in prayer after a little bit. Father, we come before you this day. Lord, how could we ever thank you enough? When you look at me and my brothers and sisters here, you see your holy, righteous son. We don't understand how it could ever happen, Lord. And if we didn't read the words, I don't think we could ever believe it. But it's true. And Lord, we thank you that by the sacrifice of your son, we have been made holy. Worthy, Father, to be a part of the the wedding feast that will last forever. Lord, help us to understand your calling also has to do with calling others through us. And Father, help us by our actions and by our words to represent you well in this world, in our homes, in our places of work, in our schools, and in the streets around us, Lord, even when it's a very difficult thing to do. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. There it is. He's good. He found it quick. Um, I'll tell you what, folks. Sometime before this whole COVID thing is over and done with, we're going to have a tutorial how to open these things. Oh, my goodness. My, my, one of my daughters had to teach me how to do it. Like, you gotta, you got to break it in half as you open it up, and then it kind of pops open just like, like a clam, and you can get the pearl or something like that. You know what I'm saying? But um, uh, I don't know if we'll technically do that, but if you got any issues with it, come up to me after church, and I'll show you how to do it, all right? Um, guys, it's really good to see you. Um, and for those of you who are at home, we hope to see you soon. And uh, it's just it's good to be with you. It really, really is. And for some of you who, who didn't get the opportunity to be with family the way that you would have liked over Thanksgiving, um, I hope that today was an encouragement with you because look around you. These people are your family as well. All right. Um, let's pray and let's head out into this world this week in a way that our God desires us to do so. If you got anything, the Lord is working on you about anything, I'll be up here for a while after the service if you need to visit about anything. Uh, it has nothing to do with what we looked at today, but there is other people in this room who would be more than happy to talk to you about the Lord, right? Would you pray with me? Father, we come before you. We thank you so much, Lord, for who you are and who you call us to be. We thank you for the words of your son, the encouragement that they are, the peace that we can find, Lord, in the power of his words peace that is difficult to find in this world at times and there's some hurting people out there lord there's some hurting people in this room i pray father they would feel your presence your strength and if they are a stranger to you that they would hear your call help us lord to be about your business this week the business of your kingdom help us be ready to share the truth and to love the people we're sharing it with. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.